Welcome to the second day of Elevate Festival 2023. It's our 19th edition under the theme Unlikely Alliances. And I am personally, but also of course in the role of Elevate, part, being part of the curational team, thrilled to welcome a true luminary in the fields of science fiction, activism and journalism, Cory Doctorov. He's here today for our, lec for our lecture and he will talk about, on one hand, his newest book with Rebecca Giblin on choke point capitalism, which I believe is very much on point to what I guess many people here are dealing with, fighting with, or having a need to fight for more rights as producers, producers of creative arts, music, all sorts of, yeah, the things that make our world maybe a more lively place. And Corey will attack this topic and of course he is also known for his science fiction books maybe some of you are as much fans of his not dystopian rather also encouraging topics he tackles in from little brother to the newest book uh, attack surface radicalized some of them are to be found over there in our entrance hall and a good news ahead. After this talk that will ta uh, take about 40 minutes, we will have a session of short Q&A. I will have some questions prepared, but of course I invite you to join this discussion with Corey. And he also agreed to be available for some book signing afterwards too. So if you brought some of your books or if you want to still grab one, there are some of his latest books in his uh, output, his creative output. There's just two or three books out of his, I think, over of, uh, yeah, higher numbers. But yes, let's not forget that Elevate is also a platform that has been fostering a discourse where Corey actually is on the front line since many, many years. A discourse on digital democracy, on surveillance, on the economic parts of it that sometimes get overshaded by discussions of how technology is so complex that it's hard to understand and that we're at the hands of geniuses, evil geniuses, maybe like the, the likes such as Elon Musk or others. But in fact, maybe there has been some blindness to it or even some double bind to it when it came to what policymakers, what politicians failed to recognize or even opened the doors to the creation of monopolies or monopsonies. Corey will probably introduce you to this term, to this thinking too. And yes, before I continue talking too much about a person you probably all admire, I might also say hello to the people following on the stream, online, and of course to the listeners of the free radio, Freie Radios in der Steiermark in Salzburg und Radio Helsinki. So without further ado, please join me, Corey, on stage, and yeah, we are honored, really much honored to have you. I'm a little bit starstruck, I have to admit, and yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Guten Abend, anschuldig, mein Deutsch ist sehr schlecht, ich will Englisch gesprochen. And uh, having said that, I am one of nature's fast talkers, and I have consumed enough caffeine to kill a rhinoceros. And so when I start speaking too quickly for non-native English speakers to understand, I invite you to do this, and I will slow down. I might speed up again. Just do it again. So I, I co-authored this book that I'm here to talk about today, Choke Point Capitalism, with my colleague Rebecca Giblin. She's an Australian copyright scholar uh, at the University of Melbourne. And Rebecca and I, uh, between us, have spent about 40 years in the copyright wars, uh, arguing about which copyright we should have, how much copyright we should have, and we have both been struck by just how stupid this debate has become. It's just sort of either you're on the side of big tech or you're on the side of big content, and if you're on the side of big tech, it's because you care about users, and if you're on the side of big content, it's because you care about creators, and of course, Neither the large entertainment firms nor the large technology firms are good proxies for the interests of internet users or creators. And in fact, in the theme of the conference here, I think that um, 
creators and users are class allies. Uh, and we should be aligned against the sources of our misery, which is the large platforms. So one of the mysteries that we set out to solve in this book is how it is that over the last 40 years, we've made copyright last longer, we've made it cover more kinds of works, we've created more intense penalties for copyright infringement in the United States. There's a civil penalty of $150,000 per infringement and a criminal penalty of $250,000 per infringement. And then it's become easier and easier to prove infringement, uh, lower bar for evidence. The industries that bring creative works to the audience, the, the creative industries, they're larger and more profitable than they've ever been. And yet, creators, earn less, both proportionately and in real terms, than they have. And that creative wage has been falling for 40 years, even as the profitability of the firms that bring creative works to the market has increased over 40 years. So how is this possible? How is it possible that we give rights to creators and those rights do not benefit creators, but they do benefit the intermediaries that we have to deal with? And I think the answer is in the structure of the market. After all, when there's five giant publishers, and four giant movie studios, three giant record labels, two giant ad tech companies, and one company that controls all the ebooks and all the audiobooks, giving a creator more copyright is like giving a bullied kid extra lunch money. It doesn't matter how much lunch money you give to that bullied kid, that kid is gonna have all their lunch money taken by the bullies. In fact, if you give that kid enough lunch money, the bullies will have enough lunch money left over after they've taken care of themselves, to run a global advertising campaign saying, someone think of the hungry children, they need more lunch money. And none of that lunch money will get them lunch either. Now, how do we end up in a world where we have um, five record company, five, five publishers, four uh, studios, three labels, two ad tech companies, one ebook company? Well, it's because of something called Austrian economics. <laughs> I've come here to talk about it. Uh, the Chicago School, which is not in Austria, was uh, heavily influenced by von Mises, von Hayek. Uh, they uh, conceived of a new theory of competition law, what Americans call antitrust law, grounded in something called consumer welfare. So historically, competition law in the US and in Europe, because European competition law uh, arrived with the Marshall Plan, so it's basically grounded in American competition law. Those of you who are a little younger after World War II, America came and rebuilt Europe, and one of the things they did was gave Europe big chunks of its legal system. So both in America and in Europe, the theory of competition law had been that when companies get big enough, they become poisonous. They become too big to fail and too big to jail. That they're able to corrupt our political process, and that the highly technical truth-seeking exercises that is our regulation become auctions where the truth is sold to the highest bidder. There's five companies in an industry. It's really easy for them not only to extract a lot of money, both from their suppliers and from their customers, but it's easy for them to decide how to spend it. You know, you and your friends after this festival are going to have a hard time figuring out where to go for dinner, right? When there's 100 companies in a sector, they can't figure out how to cater their annual meeting or what city it should be held in. When there's three of them, they all know exactly what they want and they get it. And so historically, we just said we shouldn't allow corporate power to concentrate. And with the Austrian school, we decided that that was the wrong way to approach it, that the only thing that we should consider is something called consumer welfare. And in this narrow conception of consumer welfare, um, the only thing that antitrust regulators should concern themselves with is whether prices go up or quality goes down, provably because of a market concentration. So it's not enough that one company buys all the other companies and then the prices go up. You also have to prove as a regulator that the reason the prices went up is because they were concentrated. And as a practical matter, this is impossible. I'll tell you how impossible it is. I'll use a European example. One company, Luxottica Essilor, an Italian-French conglomerate, makes all the eyeglasses in the world. It doesn't matter if you're wearing Oliver Peoples, Dolce & Cabana, Coach, Bausch & Lohm, uh, Oakley, one company. Also, every retailer, Sunglass Hut, uh, Lens Crafters, Sears Optical, Target Optical, all one company. Also, all the lenses, 
uh, come from Essilor. 50, more than 50% of the lenses in the world come from Essilor. And all the insurance for eyewear is written by the same company. They own iMed. And they've raised the price of glasses 1,000% in the last 10 years. They stole our eyes. And regulators won't regulate against them because they say we can't prove that they did it by buying every brand, every retailer, all the lens manufacturing and the largest insurer, which then bought all of its competing insurers. Maybe it happened because oil prices went up. Maybe it happened because labor prices went up. Maybe it happened because the moon is in Venus. Whatever it is, we can't prove it. And so now your glasses cost 10 times as much. So over the last 10 years, or 40 years rather, we've had this incredible tolerance for mergers. And those mergers have created uh, monopolies, but also monopsony. Nobody knows the word monopsony because we, we don't have family destroying board games called monopsony. But monopsony is the evil sister of monopoly. Monopsony is when uh, buyers have power. Monopoly is when sellers have power. And so when you are selling your labor, your creative labor, your book to a publisher, your music to a music label, um, if there's only one company or two companies or three companies that buy it, you live in a monopsonistic market and there's a buyer that has buyer power. And so um, this is basically how we ended up where we are today. Now, all of the companies that are squeezing artists in different ways, whether that's Ticketmaster Live Nation, or the single film exhibitor that dominates American film exhibition, AMC, or the four studios, or the five publishers, and so on, all these companies, they have highly technical ways that they rip off creators, but they all have the same kind of shape, right? Um, once, you, once you kind of unpick all the complexity. So the first half of our book, is just going through case study by case study, going through these very performatively complex economic arrangements. Um, there's a, a phrase in uh, finance for this. They, they call it MIGO, and MIGO is an acronym. It stands for My Eyes Glaze Over. It's when you make something so complicated that anyone who tries to read it immediately falls asleep. Right? And the idea is that if you give an investor a prospectus that's thick enough, they'll say, well, there must be something good in here, right? A pile of shit this big probably has a pony underneath it. And so for the first half of the book, it's just about sort of opening these matryoshkas where there's a smaller doll and a smaller doll and a smaller doll, and showing the, the middle, it's just shit, right? It's just these very complex arrangements. So I'll give you an example of, of one of those. We, we, we devote a couple of chapters to how Spotify works. So Spotify, largest streaming company in the world, another European company, um, when Spotify was starting, it needed to get a license for the catalog that it wanted to stream. Now that catalog is controlled by three companies. Sony, Universal, and Warner Music control 70% of all the music recordings in, the, in world history. They also control 65% of the music publishing rights in the world. They didn't get that by investing in music. They got it by buying other companies uh, at fire sale prices. So they, they are not music investors, they're a finance company. And they own all of this stuff. And so Spotify went to them and said, um, we would like a license to stream your catalog. And the three labels said, you can have that license. All you need to do is give us large equity stakes in Spotify. So we will be your business partners and we'll own Spotify. Now here's the thing. Spotify's owners and Spotify's suppliers have different irreconcilable interests. If you're a Spotify supplier, right, if you're sending music to Spotify, you want the royalty to be as high as possible. If you're the owner of Spotify, you want the royalty that's as low as possible. Because every euro that you pay for music is a euro you can't pay to your investors. So here we have the labels. And the labels are both the supplier and the owner of Spotify. But when the labels bring in money that's a, a, a royalty for their artists, their artists have a claim on it. They have to give some of it to the artists. When the labels take in money as investors and take a capital gain from Spotify, they don't have to give that to anyone. They can give it to some artists, to no artist, a little bit to every artist. They can keep it for themselves, pay it in bonuses, spend it on cocaine. It's their money. It's not the artist's money. And so Spotify was able to negotiate with the labels for an incredibly low rate for uh, the price per stream. But the labels were also able to negotiate a minimum monthly guaranteed payment. So if you're Warner, you're entitled to say a minimum of $10 million a month. But because the rate is so low, 
only five million of that money can be attributed. Right? Only five million of that comes from a stream. The rest of it is just money that's owed to Sony. And so Sony, once again, can give that to every artist, to no artists, to some artists, to their shareholders, to their executives. It's their money to play with. Now, uh, in addition to doing this, the three labels negotiated a, a clause that's called the Most Favored Nation Clause. And the Most Favored Nation Clause says that um, no one is allowed to get paid more for their streams than the big three labels. So remember I said 70% of all the music is controlled by the big three labels? That means 30% isn't, right? You've got a bunch of cool electronica bohemian folks playing in town today. I bet you a lot of them are represented by small labels or, or are independent and direct to their audience. Their maximum rate is set by the big three. But they don't get a minimum monthly payment. They don't own large tranches of stock in Spotify. They don't get free advertising. They don't get included in playlists for free. The big three, any popular playlist they want, they can put their music in. If you're one of the independent artists, you have to pay. You have to give up the tiny amount of money that you'd normally be entitled to to put it in there. Now, this sounds complex and terrible, but the thing I want you to understand is that that portfolio of copyrights that the big three labels were able to leverage into control over the future of their industry, that portfolio was so potent in part because of the rights we gave to artists. So remember I started by saying we've made copyrights last longer? So copyrights that are commissioned by corporate uh, entities endure for 90 years. There isn't anyone, to a first approximation, someone out there, but almost no one listens to 91-year-old recordings which is to say that as far as the commercial life of recordings go, these copyrights might as well be perpetual, which means that the portfolio that the labels amassed, because we made copyright last longer for artists, let them control the future of the music industry so they didn't have to pay as much to artists. Right? So this is how uh, creating more exclusive rights in a regime in which buyers have power does not produce um, uh, any kind of dividend for suppliers. And it's why every time you hear someone talk about Spotify, you hear them say, well, Spotify gives a lot of money to the labels, but the artists don't get much money. Both of those things are true. Both of those things are absolutely true. So um, we do this for many companies. We do it for Amazon, we do it for YouTube, we do it for lots of other companies, tech and entertainment. And YouTube's an interesting example here because YouTube also has a music streaming service. And it's not run by the big three labels. It's run by the one giant search engine. It's owned by Google, right? Google uh, is a company that had one good idea 25 years ago. They made a really good search engine. Um, they haven't made a successful product internally since. They made a Hotmail clone that was pretty good, Gmail. Every other product that they've made in-house has not succeeded. The Wi-Fi balloons, the smart cities, Google Reader, uh, um, uh, Google Plus, all of these products have, have failed. Every other successful product Google has, they bought in the capital markets. Right? They bought their server management, they bought their advertising technology, they bought their mobile platform, they bought their video platform, they bought docs, they bought calendars, they bought maps, they bought satellite photos. All of those are acquisitions that before the Austrian school, <laughs> we would have said, you're not allowed to buy them. I don't want to blame you guys. It was Americans who did it. I just think it's hilarious that we're talking about the Austrian school. It's like one time I came here and someone said, I was in Graz 15 years ago, and someone said, what do you think about the California ideology? And I'm like, well, given that it was dreamed up by two Austrians and it's currently being executed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think you don't get to ask me about that. <laughs> um, but um, we, we pick apart all of these different firms and we show how each of them has their own performatively complex way of understanding it. Things that are complex so they'll be hard to understand, but are said to be hard to understand because they're complicated. And we show how they all work and then um, uh, we, we try to develop a theory of how these choke points emerged and why these intermediaries are different. Because intermedi intermediaries themselves are not bad. There's, there are lots, there's lots of good reasons to have intermediaries. Like, I don't think it's bad that the way that I got to speak to you was a festival organizing my appearance. It would be a giant pain in the ass for me to have to call all of you and invite you down to this hall and rent it so I could come and speak to you. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Toronto, 
we had this street author, this outsider author. He was a wonderful guy named Krad Kolodny, very grumpy. And he used to write his own weird stories, and he'd print them, he'd bind them, he'd design the cover art, he would um, uh, carry a stack of them, he'd stand on a street corner in the freezing Toronto winter, and he wore a sign around his neck that said, very famous Canadian author, buy my books. Uh, he also had a sign that just said, Margaret Atwood, which I thought was very funny. And he'd stand outside of the bars, at, at, at night in the freezing cold and sell his books to drunks. And he would make secret recordings of them with a tape recorder and then sell tapes of drunks being weird on Toronto street corners. He was a great, strange guy. He didn't have a single intermediary in his whole career. This is a guy who had no intermediaries. And I can still quote some of his weird poetry from memory, but I think that even he would not say everyone should have to do it the way he did it. There are lots of people who have words that I want to read who are never going to print and bind their own books, stand on a street corner, and, and sell them. And obviously, we've had problems with intermediaries before. It's not like record labels have a long history of being wonderful to musicians. The Beatles used to share one cent per LP, but not the whole cent, because 15% of that one cent was kept back by their label for promotional purposes and then they had to give their manager 10%. But whatever was left over of that three quarters of a penny, they could split four ways. So it's not, and the Beatles had it good. They were white, right? Black artists had it much worse than the Beatles. <laughs> For one thing, when the Beatles wanted to rip off black music, no one stopped them. And when hip hop artists started sampling the Beatles, they all got sued into oblivion. So, um, this is, this is um, not new, right, for intermediaries to be abusive. So what is it that's different about digital intermediaries? What, what is choke point capitalism when it's at home? And I want to say that choke point capitalism is a pathology that is endemic to platforms that are digital under monopoly conditions. So you first have this lax uh, competition enforcement. You allow anti-competitive mergers. Google gets to become Google by having one good idea and lots of money, and they buy everybody else. You have these catch and kill acquisitions where companies buy other companies and shut them down. Do you remember there was a 10-year period when Yahoo bought every promising internet company and then destroyed it? Right? So these are catch and kill acquisitions, predatory acquisitions. You create vertical monopolies. So you have a company that represents the whole stack. So there's obviously uh, lawsuits about Google and ad tech right now, where Google is the publisher, the market maker, the seller's representative, and the buyer's representative. And each one of those takes fees, and each one of them uh, uh, engineers the transactions. And of course, Google is one of the most profitable companies in the history of the world, and they say it's because they have a great marketplace. I think that we should at least consider the possibility that the reason they have it is because they have a very corrupt marketplace where they represent everyone in the chain and no one can see what they're doing and it all moves around very quickly. So all of that, it's stuff we've had for a long time. Predatory pricing, you know, where Uber takes $31 billion from the Saudi royal family, loses 41 cents on every dollar they earn for 15 years, destroys every taxi company in the world, raises prices and cuts driver's wages. That's not new. Companies have done predatory pricing before. But um, companies are able to take all of this and then uh, do something very specific that I think is new, or at least faster than we've seen before. And that's the, uh, playing a game with surpluses. Surpluses is a word economists use. I spent 10 years learning to talk like an economist so I can make fun of them. Um, economists use surplus to describe sort of everything that's left over, not just the profit, but everything that's like free to play with, all the free uh, movement within a system. And these firms, the platforms, they allocate these surpluses in very deliberate ways. So the platform first will allocate surpluses to users. So um, think of what Amazon did, right, when Amazon started off. Uh, they sold goods below price, right? So that's obviously a way of allocating a surplus to a user. You've got investors, they give you money, you buy a thing for a dollar, you sell it for 50 cents. That is a surplus that goes straight to the user. They subsidized returns. They subsidized shipping. People were paying less than it cost to do all of those things. And Amazon built up a very large business. Um, Facebook did the same thing, right? When you first signed up for Facebook, if you remember, Facebook was only available to American college students. You had to have a .edu address. Uh, and then they opened it up to the general public. And their story was, come be a Facebook user. We won't spy on you the way MySpace does. We will never invade your privacy. 
right? And when you signed up for Facebook, you told it who mattered to you. These are all the people that I love and care about, and then all Facebook did was tell you everything they had to say, just in a feed, right? That is a surplus allocated to you. The users get locked in. In the case of Amazon, they get habituated to Amazon. They buy a lot of e-books and audiobooks with digital rights management that they would have to give up if they left Amazon because it's locked to Amazon's platform. Under Article 2 of the copyright, uh, European Copyright Directive, uh, it's against the law to remove that DRM even if the rights holder wants you to, uh, even if you're authorized by them. Uh, in the US, doing that is a felony punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine. So every time you spend a euro on a Kindle book or an Audible book, that's a euro you have to forfeit if you no longer want to use Kindles and Audible players. Um, so the users get locked in, they buy Prime, so they prepay for a year's worth of shipping, they're unlikely to go somewhere else. So here you have all this surplus um, that the users have been given, and in exchange the users lock themselves to the platform. With Facebook, uh, we lock each other to the platform. It's that collective action problem again. You can't figure out on where to go for dinner. You also you know, really can't figure out where you should go after Facebook or even when it's time to leave. And so you stay because your friends are there, your friends stay because you're there, right? Everyone's holding each other hostage. Once the users are locked in, they start to reallocate surpluses to business customers. So if you were a media company for, on Facebook, you could post a little short excerpt of an article and a link, and Facebook would like non-consensually ram that down the eyeballs of millions of Facebook users who never asked to see it. And it would turn into a, tra a traffic funnel that would flood your website with viewers, readers, and all the ads were your ads, and you got to keep all the money, right? Um, if you were an advertiser, well, Facebook took some of the surplus from users by spying on them, and then they sold it to you really cheaply. If any of you were involved with anything that used Facebook ad targeting 10 years ago, it was amazing. It cost you nothing. They showed it to a jillion people, and it was really well targeted because they were spying on people with every hour God sent. And so that's a way to take surplus away from users and give it to advertisers. So the advertisers get locked in, the media companies get locked in, performers, creators, right? If people subscribe to your feed, they, sh you know, they got it. Facebook would also boost your feed into um, the feeds of people who never asked to see you. Right? They called it a suggestion, but really what it was, was taking something out that the user had asked to see and replacing it with something they hadn't asked to see. It's taking a surplus from one user and giving it to the other user. Then once the performers are locked in, they've given up their website. Once the um, uh, media companies are dependent on Facebook for their traffic, once the advertisers have, have uh, reoriented themselves to only advertising on Facebook, Facebook takes that surplus and gives it to itself. That's the life cycle. First you give surplus to users, then you give it to business customers, then you take it for yourself. So on Amazon, it's just wage theft. One of the scandals we document in, on, in, a, in our book is something called Audiblegate, where Amazon stole $200 million from Audible authors, independent Audible authors, just, just stole it. Told them they were paying them one thing, paid them a different amount, uh, was so opaque in its accounting that the users couldn't have it. I, I would go into it, but you know we don't have time. It's more Migos stuff. It's just, just your basic accounting fraud. Um, they, uh, uh, Amazon um, takes surplus away from users, right? If you go and search on Amazon today, 50% of the first five screens is advertising. The whole first screen is advertising, right? It's not the thing you looked for. It's Amazon's um, uh, selling to its business users the right to bid against each other to answer a query with the wrong answer, right? You type in, I want to see X, and Amazon doesn't show you X. It shows you Y, where Y is the thing that someone paid the most to show you when you're searching for X. It's just taking surplus away from you. Also taking surplus away from business customers. Amazon's ad business is worth $31 billion a year. Facebook today, if you're a publisher and you publish on Facebook, um, uh, if you include a link to your website, it won't be shown to anyone. But even if you don't include a link to your website, it probably won't be shown to anyone unless you put the full text of the article. So there's no reason to go back to your website. And even then, the people who subscribe to your feed probably won't see it unless you pay to boost it. So again, taking surplus from users who asked to see what the media company published, and taking surplus away from media companies who are publishing it, and handing it to Facebook shareholders. And if you're an advertiser on Facebook, well, Facebook charges more for ads 
that fewer people see because they, not because they, they're not charging you to show them to people, they just don't, it's ad fraud, they just don't show it to people. Facebook and Google colluded to rig the ad market. I just yesterday was on a panel with a Texas attorney general in Brussels who uh, subpoenaed documents from Google that documented that Facebook and Google illegally colluded to do a program called Jedi Blue. They all have terrible names. Jedi Blue, where they just rigged the ad market. They just took money from advertisers, made, made advertising cost more, gave less of it to media companies. So everyone whom Facebook once was good to, they've taken the surplus away from. True of Amazon, true of Apple's App Store, true of Google's App Store. Uh, you name the platform, this is how they operate. So I have a name for this kind of platform economics, and I call it inshitification. Right? And it's not your imagination. Like the internet really did used to be better. Uh, there was a time when the internet wasn't five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. There was a time where the, your feed was full of the things that you wanted to see, not full of things that were profitable for someone else to show you. And um, inshitification is the downstream product of this market concentration under digital conditions. Because if you're a grocer, and you want to do price fixing. We just had a price fixing scandal in Canada. You could not get more Les Miserables. Our, our billionaire plutocrat grocery family fixed the price of bread. I mean, honestly, like how unoriginal, right? If you want to fix the price of bread, you need to send an army of teenagers out with pricing guns to change the prices. If you're Amazon and you're running Amazon Fresh, their online grocery store, you drag a slider, right? And the price changes. So this is how you get this very high-speed shell game. You know, if you've ever seen someone playing the shell game, playing the three-card Monty game, the faster they move, the harder it is to figure out what they're doing. And on the platform side, you can move very, very quickly. I call this twiddling. And it's why the platform Kremlinology, where, where people try to figure out what, what platforms are doing on the other side. I just uh, recorded a podcast with a friend of mine uh, who said, um, don't swear in the first 30 seconds. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because they demonetize you. And I said, is that a rule? And he said, no, but we all know it's true. Right? Well, maybe it's true, right? Like maybe if you spend enough time on the platform, this is my one German word, if you spend enough time on the platform, you develop some Fingerspitzengefühl, right? <laughs> But even if you develop that, even if you're right, right, even if you do have the thing balanced on the tips of your fingers and you know how it's going, they can change it so quickly that you'll never know what they did. So this is something unique in digital and makes it very hard for creators to um, understand how they're gonna be compensated, which is why creative workers on the platforms are like people whose boss, every time it's their paycheck, so it gives them a paycheck that's just missing some money. And when you say, boss, why wasn't I paid for all the hours I worked? Your boss says, well, you broke some rules. And you say, well, what rules did I break, boss? And he says, well, if I told you that, you'd figure out how to break them without my noticing. Just take my word for it, you broke some rules. So you're a creator, you spend 100 hours on a video or a song or a book or a post. That's how you make your money. You put it on the platform. The platform just decides not to show it to anyone someone's wiggling the sliders, right? So that's the second f um, aspect of inshittification. You have concentrated platforms, you have high-speed twiddling, and then you have uh, the third piece, which I alluded to before, which is that it's against the law for us to twiddle back. If you remove DRM to change how the player works, if you want to add an ad blocker, ad blocking is the largest boycott in human history, but you can't ad block in an app you can't ad block on Discord. You can't ad block on any of the services that are, that are wrapped in digital rights management. We can't twiddle that back. If you reverse engineer Facebook to make an alternative client, there's a, a client called OG app for Instagram. It takes your whole feed, throws away all the ads, throws away all the suggestions, throws away all the fake TikTok videos, and just puts the things from the people that are in your friend list in reverse chronological order. Facebook shut them down within a day. If you want to do that, they'll, they'll either shut you down or they'll sue you. If you want to make your own app store, they'll reduce you to radioactive rubble, right? So we can't twiddle back. They twiddle us with every hour that God sends. We can't twiddle back. So those are the three characteristics. We can't twiddle back. They twiddle us. And they're super concentrated, so there's nowhere else to go. And with those three characteristics, we get twiddled to death. And so in the book, we propose a bunch of technical remedies for this things that um, reduce buyer power, uh, spread out the choke points, 
produce um, uh, seller power so that we, we have more power as sellers of our labor and um, give users more power that pose the, this as a natural alliance between users and performers or creators. Uh, um, I'm going to give you just one example because they're all highly technical because none of them are individual solutions. Like None of them are like, if you only buy your music this way, everything will be fine. You can't shop your way out of a monopoly, just like you can't recycle your way out of a climate emergency. Right? These are not individual problems, they're systemic problems. That's bad news, right? It's kind of a bummer. One of the editors who rejected this book said, you know, I'd buy it, but all your solutions are systemic, and everyone's going to be really sad when they realize they, there's nothing they can do as an individual. I was like, dude, you are so close to getting it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, on the other hand, anything that can't go on forever will eventually stop. And when it stops, there's this moment in which ideas that are at the fringe can come to the center. This is one of the other tenets of Austrian economics, practiced by that noted Austrian Milton Friedman, who wasn't an Austrian, but um, who was the, their foremost acolyte in America. And when Milton Friedman was a crank teaching theories that no one cared about at the University of Chicago, uh, people said, Milton, how will anyone ever listen to you? We've just had the New Deal, we've had the 30 glorious years, les temps glorieux, the, 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 the post-war era of unparalleled prosperity. You want to take it away from everybody. Who's ever going to listen to you with your terrible ideas? And he said, eventually there will be a crisis. And when the crisis comes, ideas that are lying around will go from the edge to the center. And that's what happened. That's how we got here. So our idea here is to make ideas lying around. And I'm going to give you just one example so then we can go to Q&A. Um, and it's uh, a one weird trick. <laughs> if, um, if you have a creative contract that entitles you to royalties for a game, music, a book, um, a video, uh, you are typically entitled to audit the royalty statement, audit the firm that gives you your royalty statement. Now, um, you will find, if you audit the firm that gives you your royalty statement, that they sometimes make mistakes. And for reasons I can't possibly begin to understand, when they make mistakes, it always seems to be in their favor. Um, we cite uh, one firm in Los Angeles where I live that has done tens of thousands of record company audits over three decades. And in every instance except for one, the errors that they found were in the favor of the label and not the recording artist. I can only assume that there's some kind of very vexing localized probability storm that makes life very hard for the accounts at record companies. I can't think of a single other explanation. So um, when you tell them, you stole my money and I'd like you to give it to me now, they will say, you artists, you're adorable, but you can't do math. You're sadly mistaken. We don't owe you anything, and you can't afford to sue us. But tell you what, since we're such nice guys, how about if we give you some of the money that you think we owe you, and all you need to do is sign a non-disclosure agreement so you can't tell anyone else where we're hiding the money we stole from them. So one of our sources in our book uh, violated their non-disclosure agreement to describe a, an instance in which they found a six-figure discrepancy. And in order to get the money that they were owed, hundreds of thousands of dollars, they had to sign a non-disclosure. But it doesn't end there. They also say, by the way, your accountant has to promise they'll never audit us again, because now they know where we hide the bodies. Right? This is like the suspected murderer. The cops show up, and, the, and he says, officers, Dig anywhere you'd like in my garden, just not in that corner. I'm very sentimental about it, right? Well, here's a funny thing about monopolies. All of these contracts are settled in four states. California and New York, everyone knows. Tennessee, because of Nashville. And Washington State, because Amazon and video game companies. And contract is a matter of state law. And everyone in the world who's signing a contract with an American entertainment company is signing a contract in one of those four states. If we were to amend the state contract code in one or more of those states to say, as a matter of public policy, non-disclosure agreements are not enforceable where they pertain to material errors and omissions that were down to the detriment of creative workers, um, we would put more money in the pockets of more artists than 40 years of copyright term extension combined. Right? This is a crack in the machine. We stick a lever in it, we wiggle it around, and money pours out. Right? If making copyright last longer was the right to be angry at your fans because you didn't like how they listened to your music, this is the right to put groceries on your table, braces on your kids' teeth, and a roof over your head.
It's material things, and that's what matters. So we have a second half of the book that's just full of these proposals to adjust the material living circumstances of creators. Not to give creators more rights, but to give them more money, and sometimes at the expense of control, but to give them more money. Um, maybe uh, when we do the Q&A, we can talk about an instance of that. Um, there's, a, there's a good little story about Taylor Swift and, uh, and De La Soul that we could get into. But that's kind of the pitch of the book, right? That it's a book that is about giving you uh, some understanding of how these markets work, how they're rigged, and also to introduce technical proposals. So, you know, here in Europe, we had the uh, Copyright and the Digital Single Markets Directive in 2019 that created all kinds of rules, some of them very good, right? There's a, there's a transparency rule that says that companies have to tell you where they've sold your work, how they made money for it, and how they figured out how much they owed you. That's an incredibly powerful rule. But it also has some really terrible ideas in it, like a mandatory copyright filter for anyone who accepts uploads from uh, the public, right? Those filters, Google has built one for YouTube, it's called Content ID, it costs them $100 million. If no one can enter the European market, without having $100 million to spend on a non-functional copyright filter, Google gets to run the show forever, which is why YouTube endorsed this proposal. You had a bunch of creators groups who thought that they were sticking it to Google. Meanwhile, Google was going around the European Parliament saying, this sounds great to us, right? So the next time this crisis happens, because anything that can't go on forever will eventually stop, we can say rather than let's do, it, let's do more of what we've done before, even though it didn't work, because maybe if we do it harder this time, it'll start to work, we can actually maneuver real material solutions that make life better for artists into the, into the system, rather than embracing the doctrine of the Chicago School, where, which said that so long as the pie is getting bigger, it doesn't matter which slice goes to whom. That's their doctrine. It's a, it's a doctrine that only someone who gets to eat all the pie would ever say, <laughs> because of course it matters which slice of the pie goes to who. Of course it matters. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Thank you for killing this rhinoceros on stage. And again, <laughs> thank you for traveling here. He, you got up in the morning, I think at 4.30, yeah, it <laughs> to was be an early here day. on time. This is yeah. so amazing and we're so grateful. Let me please dive a little deeper into what you just mentioned again. There are ways out, and this is one of our general topics here, mm -hmm. how to find unlikely alliances. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about this Austrian school, those uh, ideas that are, in fact, and to me, every time when I read through the book, Choke Point Capitalism, or some other of your talks, you really make it clear that the situation that we end up today, ended up with currently, so for, for now, the GAFA, the, that it's only four companies, or three, or even one when it comes to audiobooks. This is not because it was geniuses at work. Sure. This is not because of, um, I don't know, natural selection kind of things. It is actually not about, we have been told quite a lot in the last 40 years that human beings have this innate drive of competition. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's not about competition. Mm -hmm. May you elaborate Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how oftentimes the rhetoric... Uh, when it applies to them is the opposite of what they would apply to us. So they would say, well, the, the, the way that we get better media is by having all the creators compete on the platform. But the way that we get better platforms is by having all the platform owners collude on the rules that we apply to creators, right? It's one rule for them, one rule for us. We used to have this principle in competition law that was very widespread called structural separation, which basically meant that if you owned a railroad company, you couldn't also own a freight company. Because if you own the freight company and you competed with the people who shipped freight on your railroad, you could give yourself better terms. If you owned a bank, you could either loan money to businesses or you could own businesses, but you couldn't do both. Because if you are running uh, you know, uh, Jerry's Pizzeria and right next to it is Morgan Stanley's Pizzeria and you both rely on Morgan Stanley for your money, when, when Jerry needs a loan, he gets worse terms than Morgan Stanley's pizzeria. And so you will always see the, the, the firms ending up owning everything. So one of the things we dismantled when we dismantled antitrust was the presumption of structural separation, which is how you get Amazon that's a platform user and a platform seller, Google's platform user and a platform seller, and so on. And the idea here 
was that this company could both be the referee and own one of the teams. And the amazing thing is that the same judges who say, oh, well, we reject structural separation, themselves would never preside over a case involving their brother or their kid or their nephew, right? They would say, I have to recuse myself. I have a conflict of interest, right? The lawyers who argue these cases, if they were getting a divorce and the divorce lawyer said, tell you what, I'll represent you and your partner, both of you, it'll be more efficient that way. They would say, absolutely not. You cannot represent both of us. You can't be on both teams, right? Um, but they will go to court and they'll say, my client, Google, can be the referee and own the team. My client, Google, can be on the sell side and the buy side of a transaction, right? And, and this is just um, laughable. And it's only when you cloak it in economic jargon, and this is, I said, learn to speak like an economist so you can make fun of them, not so you can learn what they have to say because the last 40 years of economic doctrine are nonsense. But the only way to understand how nonsense it is is to penetrate the jargon and understand that when they talk about Pareto optimal distributional efficiencies, that what they mean is that the referee can own the team provided that they're the referee and they've got a stake in the team and not that they're the other team that's playing against the team that's owned by the referee. And there we come back to systemic problems need systemic remedies. Yep. And it's the role of regulations, in fact, that kind of were blind to it in the 90s. You have a bit of a historical excourse to it too, that in fact those kind of situations, as you just mentioned with the rail freight or other of those cases, yep. you would not have allo allowed to, to grow big as that. And the how did it actually happen and how well, can we prevent this or stop it to, to continue to happen? I mean, actually? the way that it happened depends on who you listen to. I mean, there are lots of different theories. Thomas Piketty, you know, he says that after two world wars, the plutocrats who benefited from both and who kind of started both and created the conditions for both um, were lost all their money. And so we had 30 years where rich people didn't set our policy, but because if you have capital, your capital grows faster than um, if you do things, right? If you have money and you give it to other people who are doing things, your money grows faster than theirs does. If you're Bill Gates, uh, when you started your career, to the end of your career, where you started the most successful, profitable company in the history of the world, over that same period, you made less money than Lillian Betancourt, who's the heiress of the L'Oreal fortune, who is a woman who has never done a useful thing in her life, right? So over the same period, she made more money than Bill Gates. But after Bill Gates retired, stopped running a company, and just started investing money, he made more money than either one of them, right? So having money is the best way to have money, to make money. and. Um, there are people who say, well, what changed after 30 years after the wars was that the fortunes of rich people accumulated to the point where they could put their thumb on the scales again and we, could, we got to change. The other theory, though, is, the, is that you have ideas lying around. You have mm -hmm. Friedman energetically saying plutocrats should run the world. And then you have a crisis. You have an oil shock, right? And the oil shock... Uh, makes us question everything. We have inflation, we have political instability, and in that moment, ideas from the fringe move into the center. And maybe it's both. I don't think anyone knows exactly. The good news is that we're in the midst of a counter-reformation, right? So uh, Marguerite Vestager and Terry Breton at the European Commission and DG Comp yeah. are kicking ass and taking names, excuse me, in, um, in the US. Lena Kahn, uh, who runs the Federal Trade Commission, she's incredible. So. Uh, Six years ago, seven years ago now, Lena Kahn was a third-year law student at Yale University who wrote a paper called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox, where she said, we've been doing antitrust wrong for 40 years, and here's why. Amazon's the poster child for it. She wrote this brilliant, scintillating paper as a third-year law student, right, that turned the anti-establishment bar on its head. Seven years later, she is running the Federal Trade Commission. She is the chief antitrust enforcer. She's a woman in her mid-20s who is the chief antitrust enforcer of the United States of America. And she has packed the commission and the staff with incredible, technically skilled, uh, passionate, amazing uh, staffers and commissioners. It's, it's fabulous. Uh, even the Chinese Cyberspace Directive is like, 
fuck these tech companies. They're not on China's side. We're going to rein them in, right? You have these people like Nick Clegg, a useless shower of shit, running around the European Union saying, Europe has to defend its cyberspace from China so we can't break up Facebook. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping is throwing the founders of tech companies in gulags. Now, I don't want to throw anyone in a gulag, but this does not sound like the actions of a man who thinks that the tech companies that are under his jurisdiction are doing the bidding of his country. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, the, there is a current all over the world right now about large firms usurping the role of states and about states returning to democratic fundamentals. Antitrust is a big part of it. It's not the only part. One of the things we try to do in this book is fuse antitrust and labor politics. Labor politics are very closely related to antitrust. A lot of people in the labor left um, are distrustful of antitrust because there's this kind of two-step process where you take workers and you misclassify them as independent contractors. That's what Uber does, right? And you say, oh, you're not a worker, you're an independent business. Okay, well, when workers form a union, that's okay, right? But when independent businesses form a cartel to raise prices, that's illegal under antitrust law. And so historically, there have been abuses of antitrust law to take misclassified workers who are already marginalized and exploited, who then try to uh, create solidaristic organizations to demand better wages, and we call them an illegal cartel. Now, that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. antitrust law has to be um, uh, worked that way, but it has been. And so one of the things we're trying to do is rehabilitate the role of antitrust in labor politics. So there's really this creating of ideas that lie around because the crisis is here and sure. that there is not knowledgeable action now. People with, yeah, motivating uh, stories as you just gave about the, the attorney in the US. And we have a European perspective here. We have, of course, uh, the perspective of creators here in the room. Who has comments, questions to Corey? Who wants to join the discussion? And if you want, please raise your hand. A microphone will be handed over and we ask you to stand up and, yeah, just speak. No hands? I know that that was very non-controversial. Yes, there are too. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Chaba from Budapest. Um, you mentioned Della Soul, um, and it's pretty timely and poignant because uh, I don't know if everybody knows here, but this is the day, the 3rd of March, when uh, the musical of Della Soul return was returned yeah. to the world. Um, this morning, uh, the the, the music of Della Soul returned to all the streaming platforms, and before that, it was not available to anyone. So for me, being a, a fan of hip-hop and Della Soul, I wasn't listening to their music uh, for about 15 years because I don't have a yeah. CD player and a cassette player at home, so there was practically no way to, to, to listen to them. Um, can you elaborate a little yeah. bit on why this happened and yeah. how something like this So this happened? is an amazing story. So. Um, Let's start with what happened with, um, with Taylor Swift, and then we'll talk about De La Soul, because it's an, it's an interesting study in contrast. So Taylor Swift was signed to a bad label who mistreated her. They got sold to a private equity firm who mistreated her worse, and they owned her masters. So they owned the copyrights to the recordings of her first, I believe, six studio albums. Um, and so she had railed against them. She had tried to buy her masters back from them. They wouldn't sell. They just kept selling them to other people. They're now owned by the Disney family, which has a, a, its own private equity firm. Uh, and, um, but the, the, her arch nemesis, this guy she hated that did the deal, he said to the Disney family, just to make Swift as miserable as possible, I'm going to sell you this, but I continue to get the royalties from it, just so that she knows every time she sells a record, the person that she hates the most in the world is getting money. It's just a real petty asshole, right? So what did Taylor Swift do? Well, everyone in the world has the right to record a Taylor Swift song because no one in the world ever learned to play music without playing the music of other people. Right? The Brahms's first is really Beethoven's tenth. Beethoven, uh, Brahms was a Beethoven tribute act, right? Um, and so historically, what we said is that the right to record music belongs to every musician. It doesn't belong to a particular musician. So you know, we have this idea that that um, you know, art is a collective endeavor, right? We 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 have that notion, but we still had this idea that <clears throat> creators are entrepreneurs. So although we create together, we sell our work alone in these very o overmatched uh, instances where our um, labels or studios have, the, have leverage over us. So this predates that regime, and anyone can record a, a song provided that they pay a royalty 
to the, to the underlying um, songwriter, including Taylor Swift. So Taylor Swift recorded covers of Taylor Swift songs, right? She just re-recorded her first six albums. And now if you go on Spotify or other streaming services and you look up Taylor Swift, there's her first album, and then there's her first album, and in brackets, Taylor Swift edition, right? And that's the one she gets paid for, right? Because everybody has the right to record every song. It is a right that belongs to every artist. So music sampling, when music sampling started, we weren't sure how to handle it. There's a lot of stuff that musicians do with each other's work that's like not fair dealing or fair use. It's not copyright. It's just not a licensable activity at all. Drum beats, rhythm sections, they don't belong to anyone, right? They belong to everybody. Grooves, um, genres belong to everybody. Sampling maybe belong to everybody, right? Um, in the same way that if you're a, a trumpet player, uh, sorry, I always do trombone. If you're a trombone player uh, and you're doing a solo, maybe you drop two bars of a famous song into your solo, right? That's not licensable, it's not fair dealing, it's not fair use, it doesn't, it's not covered under a blanket license, it's just a thing. It's just how jazz works, right? So maybe that's what sampling is. You take a few seconds, you loop it in a song, it doesn't belong to anybody. That's how the Beastie Boys treated it when they recorded Paul's Boutique. That's how uh, Public Enemy treated it when they recorded It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. Most successful hip hop albums of their time, if they cleared all those samples at current rates, those CDs would have cost $150 each for every copy, right? So you just couldn't make music clearing, them, the, clearing those samples. So we got a couple of bad court decisions, we got a change in practice, and we decided that samples were property and that they would accrue to musicians, right? So you would own the rights to uh, sell the right to other people to sample your song, but in a world with three record labels, giving a musician a new copyright is just a roundabout way of giving it to three record companies, which is exactly what happened. The three record labels said, we will not license samples to anyone who isn't signed to the big three, and if you sign to the big three, you have to give up your sampling rights. So what they immediately did was transfer all those sampling rights to themselves. So we could have done lots of things, right? We could have had a collective licensing the way that we do with, with live performance so, or, or with uh, recordings where we could have said, anyone can sample anything so provided they pay a set fee to a collecting society. We could have said it doesn't belong to anybody. But instead what we said is, artists are entrepreneurs of their music and here you own this right. It is your property to do with as you see fit, which was just a slightly indirect way of giving it to Sony, Warner and Universal. And 15 years later, we're finally getting our first uh, De La Soul because they couldn't clear the samples for 15 years. That's why it wasn't on streaming. Samples were only cleared for CD and they couldn't re-clear them for streaming and that's why the frontman of De La Soul who died last month didn't live long enough to hear his music on streaming, right? So this is a win for the big three labels. This is how you give more copyright to creators and reduce the amount of money creators get. Because one of the things that we should note here is that it's not only a great violence to this person's art that no one was able to hear it for 15 years. He didn't get even the pitiful amount of money you get from streaming. He got nothing from this music for 15 years, right? So this was a way to take money out of the pocket of a working artist and put it in the pocket of a giant record label by giving artists more rights. So um, we've got a debate right now about machine learning, which is a term that I hate, but it's better than artificial intelligence, which is like the stupidest cell job ever. It's not artificial, it's not intelligence. We have these, these generative tools, you know, uh, ChatGPT and, and uh, DALI and, and, and uh, Stable Diffusion and so on, and they're making work. And there are a lot of creators who are understandably, and I think correctly worried about having their labor displaced by this. Um, and so their argument has been, we should create a new right, the right to train a machine learning model from your work. We should create that right and we should give it to creators. Right? Well, that would have to be a new right because if you go to a museum and you study all the paintings and you measure how big a nose is and you measure how far it is from the lips and what colors people use, that's not a thing that copyright has ever covered. That's how like, we make art, right? We make art by studying other art. So we'd have to create a new kind of uh, esoteric right to control the study of your work in, in, under certain circumstances. Now, we actually know what would happen if we created that right. Because if you're a voice actor today, chances are you work for a game company. Gaming is hugely concentrated. And right now, all the major game studios, when you sit down to record a session, they say, um, 
the first words out of your mouth have to be, my name is Cory Doctorow, and I hereby grant permission to train a machine learning model with my voice. Right? So the only companies with the wherewithal to amass a giant corpus of work that they could use to train their machine learning model are also the companies that are the monopsonists for creative labor. They're the companies who uh, would save the most by creating that model and then firing all their creative workers. And so creating a new right to train machine, machine learning models from your work is just a way of transferring that right to the only people who pay for work and don't pay very well and make it so they never have to pay for work again. And so we need to think about things like collective ownership of rights, uh, regulation of firms, but not just giving more rights to sellers in a buyer's market because that's just giving the rights to the buyers. That's the lunch money example. That's the lunch money. Um, there was another question, and I think with respect to the following uh, panel discussion, which starts at uh, 2.30, I would go on for at least one more question, maybe then, some final remarks. And then I'll go make some Walter, books non-returnable. you were raising your hand, yeah. right? Hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, um, what is your po position on like taxation for uh, those companies, since the market regulation will take time, and even Vestaga A uh, was involved in the Facebook uh, WhatsApp deal, which was a joke. And staying here, saying yourself that the European Commission don't even have the resources to go through. Mm -hmm. So there was one, one, from one vote from her that they basically can deal like with one Microsoft uh, browser case for five years. That's it. Yeah. Well, so the European Commission is getting better, and they, there is there is some stuff happening structurally that's very interesting. So uh, a weird epiphenomenon of Brexit is that the United Kingdom, before Brexit, allocated a, a permanent set of funding to create the largest technical antitrust department in the world. It's the Digital Markets Unit of the Competition and Markets Authority with 80 full-time engineers. But one of the problems of Brexit is that Parliament has yet to like actually restore regular order and vote on normal bills. So one of the bills that they've never passed is the bill that gives this unit enforcement powers. So they have 80 full-time engineers and no enforcement powers. How, and all they do is they just sit there and they write these incredible like 400-page banger reports explaining how tech scams work. The European Union has no headcount and lots of enforcement powers. And so what the European Union is doing is they're taking the reports of the Digital Markets Unit and using it as the foundation for enforcement actions in the EU, which is actually super cool. Like, even with notwithstanding Brexit, you have people of goodwill holding hands across the channel to crush tech companies. You gotta love it, right? Um, in terms of taxation, I mean, I think taxing these firms is hard to do for the same reason that um, uh, that uh, making them obey the GDPR is. And in fact, mm. like this, that reason is Ireland, right? It, it's it's like a, a downstream of the problem of European federalism which is that we create a race to the bottom for tax and regulatory havens. So, you know, when you have countries selling golden passports to Russian oligarchs and you have countries that allow you to maintain the fiction that your, you know, your money is in an untaxed state of grace floating somewhere over the sea, uh, it, it creates this, this um, corrupting influence where Ireland's economy is dependent on the firms that use it for a tax haven, and so Ireland decides not to fund its data commissioner. And so the German data commissioner hears 500 cases a year, and the Irish data commissioner hears 17, and the Irish data commissioner is the one who's got jurisdiction over the tech companies. Now, not forever. Austria gave us another gift. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just von Mises, it was also Max Schrems. And Max mm -hmm. Schrems is making the German data commissioner hear some cases. And so maybe we'll get some cases. But I think that the taxation problem is that it's the same problem. I think that what we have to understand is that corporate power, once it's concentrated, is very hard to tease apart. And that anything we do has to be a series of actions, um, each one of which erodes corporate power in some little way. Right? It, it, we're, it's very hard to dismantle them because they can control the parliament, they can control the tax authorities, they can shop for jurisdictions, they can effectively run countries. Um, you know, this is why the, the council of the, of the Chicago school, which was to say, let monopolies form, but if they're bad, stop them, 
once they formed was a terrible idea because once they formed, you can't stop them. That's the whole point. That's why we want to stop them before they form because they corrupt our political process. And so taxation is one of the things we need to do. We need to starve them of the capital that they have, uh, that they use to corrupt our political process. We need to break them up. That's slow and hard. Uh, it took 69 years to break up AT&T, right? It's not easy. Um, we need to curb their power with things like the Digital Markets uh, Act and the, the Digital Services Act, the DSA and the DMA. Um, we need to uh, create um, user power and uh, um, performer power, creator power, where we create alliances. I mean, remember, one of the things about inshittification is that even the people who screw us over right, the, the publishers or the labels or whatever are getting screwed over by the platforms. Like even the advertisers don't like the platforms, right, because the platforms are robbing them blind too. So we actually have unlikely alliances between people who are, are not in fact class allies but who have allied interests here. So we, we need to chip away at it, right, we need to do it one piece at a time. You know, historically corporate power only gets eroded in big blasts when there is a catastrophe, right? Mm -hmm. The wars destroyed a lot of corporate power. Um, one of the things that um, I believe it was Commissioner Vestager said yesterday is consider the role of monopolies in, in the interwar years and in the first war and the role that they played in sparking the second war, right? Uh, the monopolies are, uh, if we let monopolies finish the job themselves, they do it in a, in a, a, a blaze of, of well, another German word, Gotterdammerung, and so we probably want to not let them get to there, right? We want to we want to head them off before they arrive at it. And I think the climate emergency is going to be one of those things, right? I mean, the, the climate emergency is going to destroy unimaginable amounts of capital unimaginable amounts of capital. And one of the things about all the capital belonging to 1% of the world is if you destroy a lot of it, chances are it's gonna be mostly theirs. And so, you know, I, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I would love to have, um, you know, a solution before the capital destruction arrives. But, you know, when life gives you SARS, you make SARS barilla. And uh, maybe uh, we should, this is something that we should be watching very closely, is the moments of weakness, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the, the things that can't go on forever stopping and the chance to rush in with better ideas. Thank you for this one. Is there maybe a last quick question? Yes, thank you. Um, hi there. Um, my question would be, after all what we've heard, th these are all systematic changes that we need. What can we as creatives do right now? Join a union. That's, the, uh, that's yeah. creators unions get stuff done. One of our case studies is uh, the Hollywood um, screenwriters. So the Hollywood screenwriters, uh, Hollywood itself is very unionized uh, because of the, it, it um, had this moment after the New Deal. So I live in Burbank, which is where all the studios are. 15 union halls on Burbank Boulevard, five more on Magnolia Boulevard. Uh, it's a union town. And um, uh, the screenwriters discovered that the four agencies, there's four talent agencies in Hollywood, they bought all the smaller ones, merged them into four, two of them backed by private equity, that they had been stealing from their clients. So they had gone to the studios and they had said, um, we want to offer you a new kind of deal. Rather than us negotiating the best price we can get for our clients, we take 10%, we give them 90%. We're going to negotiate a package deal where we're going to get you a writer, a star, a director, all the talent you need because we're big talent agencies now. And then um, because it's, um, uh, we were not going to take any of the money you pay our clients, you're going to pay us a packaging fee. Now, if you've got a set budget for a program, the more you pay in the packaging fee, the less you can pay to the clients. And what the writers discovered is that the 10-90 split had become a 90-10 split, where you had showrunners where 90% of the money was being made by their agents, and 10% were being made by the writer. So on one day after taking a vote on this, and after issuing a code of conduct to the studio saying you have to stop this, and also, the, or to the labels rather, the labels were building, or the agents rather, were building studios. So they were proposing to negotiate with the creators with themselves. Right, on, the, on the creator's behalf. They said, you have to stop this. No more packaging, no more studios. The big four uh, talent agency said, no way. And one day, 7,000 writers fired their agents. They ground out a 22-month strike. All four agencies caved. Packaging is dead. The writers are getting paid. Right? The collective action works. 
And that's what creators need to do. They need to um, stop thinking of themselves as entrepreneurs out there with their work. I mean, for 20 years, remix culture has been teaching us that we're not sole creators of our work when it comes to our creative impulse, but it's left us thinking of ourselves as like Uber drivers, mm -hmm. right? I'm a small business person, I'm not a writer, you know, as part of like a, a craft guild. I'm just a small business person. I'm out there negotiating with Macmillan, you know, uh, like, I will always lose mm. <laughs> in that negotiation, right? Just like, just like any worker who negotiates with their boss on their own will always lose. The only way to win is to become part of a collective. And I think these are already great final remarks. Maybe to sum up, or not to sum up, but just to finish up this I mean, wonderful round. Thank I, I, you, Corey. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I apologize for speaking fast. I apologize for being a terrible monolingual Anglo. Uh, and thank you for tolerating my, my dumb German jokes. Oh, Appreciate my God. It. Thank you, Corey. And this warm applause is well-deserved. Thank you.